That which we have received, which is our reconciliation to God, has now been entrusted to us to act on behalf of the kingdom of God here on earth. That means you and I have the responsibility of telling the message of reconciliation to every man and woman out there. That was just a snippet from our speaker today. There is more to come. Welcome and thank you for making time to be with us today on the CBS Family Service. I will be your moderator today. My name is Jackton Omusi and I am joined by our amazing CBS worship team. Want to join us in praise and worship as we celebrate together. Oh, we worship your holy name. We give you all the glory and all the honor. Be thou exalted, King of glory.
I know you have been blessed by the ministry and worship from this amazing team serving with me this morning. Stay with us. There is more worship coming up after this sermon. Today, we join Pastor Precious Cole, a pastor at Sitam Valley Road, as he takes us through an inspiring message on the ongoing impact of Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. This is still part of our new series for the month entitled, Living My Best Life. It's now time to hear our speaker today. Help me welcome our speaker, Pastor Precious Cole, on the subject, Kingdom Diplomacy, an Ambassador of Christ. Our hashtag today is hashtag Taking New Territories, hashtag Ambassador of Christ. Indeed, welcome to Seaton Broadcast Service. What a joy to have you today. This indeed is the, Lord, the day that the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice in it. It's a joy to be with you and for the opportunity to share God's word, which we will be doing in a little while. And I'm going to be inviting us to consider a passage um, and hear God's word from uh, the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 through 21. Um, and I will be reading from the New International Version as we get to share on this wonderful day and opportunity which God has given us. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I will read from verse 16. The Bible says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come and the old one has gone. The new is here. Verse 18, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That, the God, um, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. 21, God made him who had no sin to be seen for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. May the Lord bless his word. For the next few moments, our sermon title uh, this day is Kingdom Diplomacy or what we are calling an ambassador of Christ. If you have a neighbor near you, just say to them, neighbor, are you a kingdom diplomat? Or you can write on the comment section, Kingdom Diplomacy, an ambassador of Christ. Growing up as a young child, I was born and raised in a pastor's family. So I was exposed to crusades and evangelism at, a, at an early age. And I cannot remember a crusade I went to and I didn't hear the pastor say, repent for Jesus is coming. And for a long time, actually nearly throughout my upbringing as a young boy, I tied the whole idea of salvation with just escaping hell or coming to God because he was coming back and if he came back and found me not being one of his, I will go to hell. And, as, and that's true, by the way. Hell is real. The reality of the second coming is with us and Christ will indeed come. But there is a problem with basing the message of salvation entirely on Jesus is coming because when I was born in the 90s, that was the message. Earlier on before that, that was the message, Jesus is coming. Way much earlier before that, that was the message, Jesus is coming. And the challenge is sometimes that time span is not framed or defined because for sure, as the word says, nobody knows the time nor the hour. So there are people who got born again or accepted Jesus because they were running away from he is coming. And then five years down the line, he's not yet come. Ten years down the line, he's not yet come. And it looks like he's not coming like this 
is not real and so on and so forth. So some people fall away. And when we go back and preach and tell them the same thing, get born again because Jesus is coming, their hearts are almost twice as hard as they were when they first heard the gospel. There is absolutely nothing wrong with telling people to come to faith because Jesus is coming. But that's not essentially all there is about our Christian being. We have emphasized so much on the eternal part of the salvation and we have oftentimes missed out to talk about how do we live once we come to faith? Because God saves you from a sinful world, then he doesn't take you with heaven, I mean with himself to heaven. He still leaves you here with an expectation that you will be a salt and light. And many times we evangelists have not taken time to explain or make people understand what are we born again into? How then do we conduct our lives as we anticipate eternity? How then do we live here on earth as believers as we truly wait for his second coming where we will be ushered into glory and live with him eternally? And that gap is what we hope to define today because the passage we have read lets us see that we have been born again to become ambassadors of Christ. And we will be breaking that down in a little moment. And so for as long as we are born again and we are still on this world, God has an expectation with all of us that have accepted him and have come to him through faith. And one of the things God expects us to do, one of the things he expects us to do in our time here on earth as we anticipate his return or our death is that we ought to live as ambassadors of Christ. And that's what we are going to be discussing in the next few moments. Permit me now to ask a question. Who is an ambassador? It's a term we popularly hear, not just in scripture, but in the world we live in. In the world or, you know, in the, in the global arena, the politics of our day and time, around governments, you will hear ambassadorial appointments. You will hear issues to do with diplomacy. Um, and we have diplomats from a country in another country and so on and so forth. What's that business about? What's the whole point around diplomacy and ambassadorial roles or offices? An ambassador, according to the Cambridge Dictionary, is an important official, I read and I quote, who works in a foreign country doing what? Representing his or her own country there and who is officially accepted in this position by that country. So when we are talking about an ambassador, we are simply referring to a person who's not of that jurisdiction, is of a different nationality or country. He is living in a different country as appointed or directed by the president of his home country. And his role is basically to represent the interest of his country in that foreign country that he is in. So we are talking of someone who is a foreigner existing in a new domain with the responsibility of acting on behalf and to the interest of his own country. And that brings to four quite important aspects of things we need to think about as we think of our ambassadorial state here on earth uh, in reference to the kingdom of God. Elsewhere, it still describes an ambassador as a person who represents, speaks for, or advertises a particular organization, group of people, activity, or brand. This is now what we popularly here in our day and time around our social media sports, uh, spaces, a brand ambassador. This is just someone who is acting to speak for, advertise, or just make known a certain brand and so on and so forth. And you know them, they're in your spaces, they're in your online spaces and so on and so forth. But when we talk about ambassadors of Christ, what is that about? Bearing in mind our first definition of who an ambassador is, what then does it mean to be an ambassador of Christ. Important for us to also have that at the back of our mind, Christ says to us, we are in this world, but not of this world, which seems to imply our citizenship or our sense of belonging and identity is of this world. When we come to God in faith and we are born again, we take on a new identity. We become Christ-like. So our identity is heavenly. We are kingdom people, but we are still in this world, yet not of this world. So what's the whole point? We are in this world executing the agenda 
and the mandate and acting on behalf and to the benefit of the kingdom we represent, which is the kingdom of God. So for you and I who are born again, we have a new identity and we associate ourselves with the kingdom of God and we are here primarily to act on behalf of the kingdom of heaven. And that's why we would pray in the Lord's Prayer and say, as is in heaven, so shall it be on earth. Your kingdom come to earth as is in heaven because we are here as representatives or as agents or as diplomats of the kingdom of God. Three critical things that distinguish an ambassador as we get into the meat of our discussion today. Number one, every ambassador carries a mandate or a special assignment. Every ambassador carries a mandate or a special assignment. Those ambassadors of Kenya that are representing our state in different other countries, our ambassador to the UK or to China or to the United States or to Ghana or to Somali, all these countries, they are not there for fun. They are not there for holiday. They are not there to enjoy good time with family. They are there because there are specific assignments and mandates that have been given to their trust by the government of Kenya. So they are there because there's an assignment. They are there to negotiate bilateral deals on behalf of the Kenyan government. They are there to take care of Kenyans in the diaspora in that particular jurisdiction on behalf of the country. They are there to represent our country in, in important discussions or negotiations that are happening there. So it's not a fanfare. They carry a mandate and an assignment in the natural world we live in. And the question for you is, what assignment has been entrusted to you as an ambassador of Christ here on earth? Number two, every ambassador has the authority, which is delegated, has the authority of the sender. The men and women acting on behalf of Kenya in foreign nationalities, they carry with themselves the authority of the Kenyan government. They are men and women over authority. They are men and women who have been delegated state power to act on behalf of government. What does that mean? You and I as ambassadors to the kingdom of God here on earth, we also have authority that has been delegated upon us by the kingdom we represent, which is the kingdom of God. And that I read from Matthew 28, the last verse down there, verse 20, talks about all power and authority has been given to me. Jesus, speaking to his disciples just before his ascension, and he says, and I give it to you. So we have a power, and with that power, there is an attached form or list of responsibilities, mandates, and assignments, as we will be seeing in a little while from now. So every ambassador carries with them delegated authority. What that means that is that every ambassador is accountable to the sending authority. So it means when an ambassador misbehaves, they can be recalled. Why? Because they are accountable to the authority that sends them. It also means you and I are not autonomous. We are not self-sufficient. We are accountable to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So we are not on our own. We are not here to just decide, okay, today I'm going to negotiate this deal. No, we are acting in accountability to the authority that has sent us. But also number three, and lastly, there could be many more. Every ambassador has what we call immunity. And immunity means that every ambassador enjoys protection in that foreign state where they've been sent. They enjoy protection from lawsuits, um, from being arrested, from certain um, 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 measures that would be taken on the normal citizens of that country. Ambassadors enjoy immunity so that they can be able to effectively execute the mandate and the work and the assignment they've been sent there. That does not mean that they can be irresponsible or break the law. They are still given or submitted to the law of the land, but they enjoy some form of immunity and protection. And that's exactly also our portion as ambassadors of Christ. There is an immunity and a protection we enjoy from Christ in the course of the execution of our kingdom assignment here on earth. We will step on serpents and they will not harm us. We shall bind up things here on earth and so shall it be in heaven. That's immunity that God has given angels charge over us. He hems round about us with the blood of Jesus. And so you and I can enjoy immunity 
and protection, and we have the full armor of God there to help us stay on guard as we execute the assignment of heaven right here on earth. And so briefly, as we get into consider the text we have read, what then is it about our being ambassadors of Christ here on earth? I'm going to talk about three things. Number one, the mission of an ambassador. Number two, the manner of an ambassador which speaks to the conduct. And number three, I will talk about the motivation of an ambassador. They're all in M so that you will easily remember. The mission of the ambassador, the manner of an ambassador, and number three, the motivation and what is our driving force as we execute the assignment God has given us here on earth. So let's go to the first point, the mission of an ambassador. What's our assignment? What's our role? What's our responsibility according to the text we have read in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5? Uh, I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I beg your pardon, from verse 16. The mission of an ambassador. Here, Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth, a church that was very worldly by nature. One of the churches that was laced with a lot of issues and struggles and wickedness. It's no different from what we see today. You read Corinthians, the first letter of Corinthians, and see some of the problems Paul is addressing from divisions in chapter 2, where some members are saying we belong to Paul. These ones are saying we belong to Apollos. There were sexual issues, sexual misconduct. There is a young man there that is having a sexual affair with his father's concubine, stepmom. And, and you read issues to do with food that has been offered to idols. Should we eat or should we not eat? You will read issues about the Holy Communion. You will read issues about spiritual gifts and how they were being abused. And you will read issues about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there was a lot of chaos in this church. And Paul is writing to emphasize on this chapter on the need for them to receive transformation that comes from God at the point of their salvation. And once you have received this reconciliation, he says this ministry has been entrusted to us as ambassadors of Christ. So what's the mission of an ambassador of Christ? The message of reconciliation. We find that from verse 18 through 19, if I would read, it says all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And what's that about? Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. The mission of an ambassador of Christ is simply this, that which we have received, which is our reconciliation to God, has now been entrusted to us to act on behalf of the kingdom of God here on earth. That means you and I have the responsibility of telling the message of reconciliation to every man and woman out there. So it's plain simple. That which we have received, we are sharing or making noise about it to the rest of the world so that many more people can come to the knowledge of the reconciliation we experienced at the point of our salvation. So brothers and sisters, the whole point of the gospel is that man was once separated from God. And when we read the Old Testament, we see futile efforts of man trying to make his way back to God. And the only solution is that God has to offer a sacrifice that will be perfect and will guarantee forgiveness and remission of sin once and for all. And that's why Jesus comes and for 30 years, and not even 30, 33 years, he lives a perfect life. He lives a life we and I have been unable to live. He scores 100%. If life is a test, if holiness is an exam, if righteousness is a cut, Christ scores 100%. He's the only man who was without sin. He gets it all together, scores 100%, and he marches on to Calvary. And he goes there and what happens on Calvary is that Christ takes this cut or this exam of holiness and righteousness and pleasing God. And he takes this exam paper that has his name, Jesus Christ, 
100%. He presents it before God. And then there's you and I, and we come to Jesus with our zero because on the exam of righteousness, we have fallen. We are sinners. The Bible would say, if any of you is without sin, we make God a liar. And there we are with our sins and with our struggles. And we bring our exam people and lo and behold, it's a fat zero. So there's Jesus Christ, 100%. And then there is precious call, 0%. And all these papers are presented to God. God takes the paper that has the name Jesus, score 100%. He rubs the name of Jesus on it and writes my name there. And now we have a paper that reads precious call, 100%. And I'm admitted into the kingdom. And then there is that paper that had my name. He erases my name off it with my zero. And he writes there, Jesus Christ with a 0%. So it's like what used to happen in high school when you do an exam and then the math teacher comes and says, if you scored below 70, song up and day. So the people that scored below 70 go to get a punishment. If you failed map reading, question one to seven, stand up. So Jesus is punished in my place and I get to be rewarded in his place. And that's the story of salvation. And all I need to do is believe that that has happened. And so the reconciliation we are talking about is that Jesus has come to bridge the gap that was there between man and God, which was necessitated by the disobedience of Adam and Eve. Because when Adam and Eve sinned through disobedience and they ate the fruit that God said, don't eat, the Bible says right in that moment, something changed. Such that the next morning when God shows up in the garden, he's asking, Adam, where are you? This is a God who is omnipresent. How can he be looking for an Adam when we expect he is not only knowing where Adam is, he also is where Adam is because he's an omnipresent God. The point is the separation is not physical. It is that there is a relationship God was enjoying with Adam, which when sin was introduced, it was broken. And so however close I am to you. There is a connection I don't enjoy with you because sin has come into the uh, picture and has cut that fellowship. And we live through the Old Testament to see the effects of that separation. But now in Christ, that gap has been bridged. In Christ, the penalty for that disobedience has been paid. In Christ, the, 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 the separation that was there has been bridged. And so Adam... And uh, I mean, you and I have been brought back to God and we've been reconciled and we get to not only enjoy Christ with us, Emmanuel, but now when the Holy Spirit comes to your regenerated soul, it becomes God in you. And that's the message we are entrusted to thunder across the world that God has reconciled us to himself through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If that's a good point, say a big amen. And if you read Romans chapter 5, verse 12, you will see through the disobedience of one man, sin came. And if you read down, you'll see also through the obedience of one man, righteousness came back to us. And that's what our mission is as ambassadors of Christ. Tell the world that a door has been opened. Tell men and women someone has paid the price for them to access the Savior. And that is the mission of an ambassador of Christ. How are you telling the world about this reconciliation we've received from Christ? Number two, the manner of an ambassador. How then does an ambassador carry himself? How does he conduct his life? Notice in our physical world, you cannot be an ambassador of Kenya if you are not, first of all, a citizen of Kenya. Your ambassadorial responsibility is predicated or sits on the premise of the fact that, first of all, you are a Kenyan citizen. So it begins from the place of transformation. If you read, before we get to the ambassador, Paul stresses on the need to live lives that have been transformed. Are you truly changed? Has your work changed? Has your conduct changed? Are you now reflecting God in your walk and the manner in which you carry yourself? Because until that happens, you cannot become an ambassador. Until, first of all, you become a citizen to the kingdom of God, you cannot act as an ambassador. 
until first you're born Kenyan or have become a Kenyan, whether by birth or naturalization or registration, until that has been done, then you cannot act as an ambassador. The manner of an ambassador is tied to the identity of who they are. And are you transformed? Have you come to Christ in faith? Notice Paul talks about for those that are in Christ have been transformed, are a new creation. The old is gone, a new has come. Transformation, that's the Greek word metamorpho. It's the word that give, gives us the other um, 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 word metamorphosis. We read it in bio. Think of it in the context of a butterfly and a caterpillar. These two are different. If you spot a caterpillar on your wedding gown on the day of your wedding, that is an ugly, detestable sign. You don't want to see it. If I'm the man and I notice there's a caterpillar on the girl that's about to be my wife, some people would even say, bad omen. Oh, this is the sign. She's not the one. But if you spot a beautiful butterfly making its way and landing on the shoulder of that beautiful girl in that nice gown as she's walking down the aisle, everybody goes, this is beautiful. You all pull out your phones and begin to capture that moment because it's amazing. But you don't realize the butterfly was once upon a time a caterpillar, but it went through a metamorphosis, metamorpho, a transformation that completely rendered it into a new and beautiful creature. That's what transformation does. Transformation is not plastic surgery. Transformation is not merely painting what's broken. Transformation is going down and bringing up a completely new makeover, rebuilding it, restructuring it, introducing a new identity so that there is change and there is beauty. And that's what we want to see. Are you transformed or are you merely acting and behaving like a chameleon? You drop it on something red, it changes to become red. You drop it on something green, it adjusts to become green. You drop it on something white, it camouflages to become white. Are you truly transformed or you're merely camouflaging based on your environment? When you're in church, you act churchy. When we drop you into a party, you're the life of the party. In the middle of a cursing conversation, you curse so good. When you're with unbelievers, you fit in. When you come to the worship team, you fit in. Are you truly changed? Are you truly transformed? Because the manner of the ambassador demands they must live lives that are transformed. We must see the change in your passions, in your works and desires with God, in your friendships, and so on and so forth. So an ambassador is obligated to conduct himself in a manner that aligns with the desires of the sending authority. So we expect you to behave in the manner that the sending authority has prescribed for us to behave. I don't need to go down there, but the caveat is that in case an ambassador doesn't do that, it's within the powers of the president to recall them back home. Great. And number three, and lastly, the motivation of an ambassador. What motivates us to do the things we do? What motivates us to go out? We find that in, in the 11th verse of the fifth chapter of where we have just been reading a few verses up. Verse 11 says, since we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God. And I hope it is also plain to your conscience. So if this verse is telling us anything, is that first and foremost, since we know God and what it is to fear him, we try to persuade others. The first motivation is that we know God and walk in the reverential fear of God. And the fear of God in this context is not just that goofy feeling you get when you're about to sin, that your hair stand. No, the fear of God is actually phobos in the Greek. And part of it means the recognition and reverential fear. Regard to who God is. It means that in my mind, I walk conscience of who God is. So I can obey him. I can act in favor of what will please my God. See, if there is anything that we should premise our salvation and walk with God on, it needs to be the fear of God. Joseph, in a moment with Potiphar's wife, Potiphar's wife says, the environment is clear. There are no cameras. The workers are away. Potiphar is not home. Let's just get this done. Joseph says, it's not about the environment. It is that I have a relationship with God. How can I do this against my God? I recognize 
that I'm in friendship with my God, and so there are things I cannot do. That there is the fear of God. Joseph has the fear of God, so he flees. You and I have the grace of God, so we flat. Because what's grace? God loves me no matter what. So I can do all I want, and I will come back, and I will be accepted and forgiven. And that there is a problem. That there is a flat lie. The fear of God, the recognition of who God is, is what then pumps our energy and our excitement to go out there and persuade many other people to come to the knowledge of God. Christ's love compels believers to live for him. You'll find that in verse 14 and 15 of the same chapter. For the interest of time, I will not read. But our motivation is, number one, the fear of God. Number two, the love of God that we have experienced so much goodness, we cannot keep it to ourselves. We have to shout about it so that you too can experience that love. And also importantly, freely we have received, so freely we give. So we go out there to evangelize because we've received this for free and we would want you also to enjoy and experience it. But also number four, our motivation is obedience to God. Why? Because God has commissioned you and I to go out there as ambassadors. And so we respond by obedience. We've experienced too much goodness to keep it to ourselves. So like the woman in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman whose name we are not told, but he got a transforming experience with Jesus. He even forgot, she even forgot she had gone to bring water. And what does she do? She leaves everything behind, storms into the city running with one sentence. Come and see a man. Come and see a man. And that's all about the work of an ambassador. That we are storming the cities, telling men and telling women, come see a man. If there is anything in your life that God has done, that's all you need to stand before people and say, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. Let me tell you what being reconciled back to God has been for me. And that right there will be you leaving as an ambassador of Christ here on earth. And we don't all have to stand on this pulpit to preach. There are many ways in which you can act as an ambassador of Christ. What are you writing on your social media platforms? What are you writing on your Facebook? It cannot just be that every other day it's football or every other day when you go online you're abusing this person or it's politics. Why don't you one morning wake up and just share a scripture? Why don't you one day before you go to bed, before you write those excerpts of your heartbreaks on your status, why don't you post a verse and see just how many people will be impacted by the message of reconciliation which you bear. God bless you. Thank you for listening in. I will invite us to a prayer and then we will end it right at that. And may the Lord richly bless you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day you are reminding us that we are not only custodians of that which we have received, but you've entrusted upon us the responsibility to storm into cities, to storm into spaces, in our workplaces, in our relationships and friendships, and make people aware of the reconciliation we've received from Christ. So I pray for my brothers and sisters, those tuned in on this day, may they receive grace and boldness and confidence to act as ambassadors of heaven. Those that are listening to me and they don't know you, they are not citizens of the heavenly kingdom, I pray that today you'd convict them of sin and righteousness and invite them to receive you as their Lord and Savior. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and do you good. Keep on sharing this and let's keep Jesus on the airwaves. See you again on our next broadcast. What a thought-provoking and inspiring lesson from Pastor Precious. Please share your takeaway points in the chat section. Help me welcome our worship team once again as we give God thanks for ministering to us in the service today.
Let's pray as we prepare to give. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you this day for you are the one who provides for us according to your glorious riches by Christ Jesus. And this day, as we prepare to give, Lord, I pray that you may bless every giver. And even for the one who has not uh, had anything to give this day, we pray that, Lord, you'll give them next time. And even for the uh, administration of this amount that is being given, Lord, I pray that you'll give wisdom to the ones charged with the responsibility. And even in the charging of uh, uh, even going to the uttermost parts of the world, we thank you, Father, for you are the one who hears us and you provide. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray, believing and trusting. Amen. And so let's watch this clip as we prepare to give. It is now time to express our worship to God through giving. Thank you for your continued support of God's work here at Sidom. We believe that God who sees in secret will reward you openly and abundantly. We have a common payment platform for all our giving, irrespective of which assembly you happen to attend and even for our visitors. You can give via mobile money through the platforms M-Pesa or Airtel money. The pay bill number for either system is 933934. For the account name, please indicate the SITEM assembly you attend. If you have joined us in this service but you are not a member of any SITEM assembly, just write offering in the account space. Please remember that all all other SITEM PayBill numbers remain operational. If you would like to make direct bank deposits, electronic transfers or PESA link, please use the following account. Account name, Christ is the Answer Ministries, Cooperative Bank, University Way Branch and the account number is 011-280-617-639-0. The SWIFT code K C double O K E N A. If you prefer to give through our website, kindly visit www.sitem.org. Click on the Give tab and follow the instruction for online giving. Once again, we want to appreciate every one of you for every gift, every tithe, every offering, and every generous material support. God bless you. On Wednesday at 6 p.m., we will have a live prayer service when you can send us your prayer requests and our pastors will bring them before the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. Please keep tweeting and posting and share the link for today's sermon. And remember to use our hashtag, hashtag taking new territories, hashtag ambassador of Christ. Please remember to use the annual Bible study guide this week for further study on our theme for the year 2024. If you have made a decision to follow Jesus Christ as Savior today, Please let us know by contacting the following WhatsApp number 0728-221-221 on your screen. We will be sure to follow up with you this week. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Have a wonderful week ahead.